Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. It's the show that takes you inside the unbelievable, unexplainable, macabre, and the bizarre and tries to find an answer. Hello, Caroline. Hi. Would you like to introduce our special guests for this week? Yes. So this week we're starting a special collaboration with our friends at the New York Mystery Machine podcast. Every week, hosts Adam Mace and Christina Marinelli dive into many of the same genres we do over here at Ain't It Scary. You got true crime, the paranormal, weird history, but with a particular concentration on, you guessed it, New York stories. We've been wanting to do a crossover for quite a while, and we figured the beginning of 2022 was the perfect time to kick the new year off right. So this episode, we'll be discussing part one of our coverage of the Hudson Valley UFO story. Now, the Hudson Valley in New York State is a particular center of high strangeness, as we like to call it. It's full of history, hauntings, and maybe even little green men. (laughs) Between the years of 1983 and 1986, there was an explosion in UFO sightings in this area, And the Hudson Valley has remained one of the biggest UFO hotspots, not only in America, but in the world. So, listeners, enjoy the first part of the story now, then head on over to the New York Mystery Machine podcast next Monday, January 27th, next Monday, January 17th, for part two, where our hosts on the New York Mystery Machine will tell us the rest of the story, including the very strange tale of UFO abductee, Whitley Strieber. You can find the New York Mystery Machine podcast wherever you get your shows and at at New York Mysteries, uh, NY Mysteries on Twitter and at NY Mystery Machine on Instagram. So let's give a warm welcome to Adam and Christina. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Welcome, it's nice guys. to be here. It's so good to have you. I, I know Caroline's excited to see someone's face besides me in these in these COVID times. <laughs> oh boy! Oh man! So we're doing Hudson Valley, Hudson Valley UFOs, yeah. aliens. Yeah, and guys, I'm excited to get your perspective on this because uh, you know we're Connecticut people. We're only a couple dozen miles from the Hudson Valley, but uh, you know you're the New York mystery machine, right? You're you're right in it. it this is who else would we close have on? To home. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe, but but almost maybe closer to your home than our current home. Excellent point. Excellent point. Because <laughs> we're in New York City. Yes. It, right. it, it's a good midpoint. <laughs> it is it's a good midpoint. Of. It's a good midpoint. Um, we're both equally distant from the possibility of getting abducted. Yeah. Well, actually, it's funny. We'll get into it. But some of these sightings happened uh, over towns very, very near to Carrie and I uh, that we were oh. in like last week. So. Oh, oh my God. So this does spread oh, no. up into Connecticut. Um, but, Are you guys missing moments from your from your time? Are there time lapses that you don't remember? No, but we will talk about missing no time. Speeds. We'll talk about missing time, of course, in this episode. <laughs> For uh, me, yes, but those are mostly naps. That's fair. That's fair. Fair point. You wake up from your naps with nosebleeds? <laughs> no, missing time. That, but sometimes, you know, when I when I'm sleeping real hard, maybe that's better. That's I, I, I I went into today with Christina being like, it's so weird. The last three nights, literally the last three nights of my life, I've woken up at like two between two and three thirty with nosebleeds. And Christina's first question was like, "Are you missing any any time?" Do you yeah. Anything? I was like, "No, it's no, the no, witching no, hour." Did you have dreams of like yeah. round silver rooms, anything like that? <laughs> oh, if only. <laughs> Um, so th- this one is fascinating to me because it is close to home uh, for all four of us. And it's just funny to think that just, like I said, a couple dozen miles away, Carrie, could be one of the biggest UFO hotspots in the world uh, for uh, for sightings. I believe it. Uh, certainly for a period in the 80s, because across Hudson Valley, New York, throughout the mid 80s, thousands of people reported a very specific and very similar UFO sighting. Um, it was always a silently hovering triangular craft, uh, its size anywhere between one and several football fields wide, oh my God. Oh God. <laughs> uh, with lights all along its wings. Uh, I say triangular, maybe more boomerang shaped is the way to, way to say it. Yeah. And one to three football fields across and people would just see these <sighs> hovering in the sky. Imagine that for a moment. And then imagine that thousands of people saw it. Uh, across the 80s in this very small area. It's horrific to me. 
if we're being honest. <laughs> it's kind of scary, yeah. I have very strong feelings about aliens among us. Anyway, go on. <laughs> and there's just no, there aren't really any other sighting stories that have the kind of attribution this does. Like, like when you say thousands of people, when you have hundreds of calls to police stations and dozens of police officers who saw the same thing, um, y- you have to go, well, obviously something was there. And I think that's what uh, fascinates people about this uh, story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we talked about a couple stories in our New England UFOs episode where it was like a mass sighting or experience on the same night. But um, this is this is like mass sightings for years. It's crazy. That's Uh, crazy. The number of sightings is estimated at over 5,000 in this week's main source, which was published in 1987. So that doesn't account for any sightings uh, reported after that year. Um, that, well, this is the heyday, though. Yeah, yes, that is the period of the most activity. Um, that book is called Night Siege, the Hudson Valley UFO Sightings. Um, you know, it's not the most imaginative subtitle, but Night Siege is evocative, right? Mm-hmm. It's great. Um, and it is by Philip J. Imbrogno, Bob Pratt, and J. Allen Hynek. Kind of, on that last one. Uh, Hynek <laughs> actually died during the writing of this book. Uh, R.A.P. And so he was heavily involved in the research, and his wife looked over the manuscript before it was published, but unfortunately, he didn't actually get to see the book finished. Um, For anyone who doesn't know, Hynek, uh, J. Allen Hynek was the scientific advisor for the government to Project Sign, which was the precursor to Project Grudge, which was the (laughs) precursor to Project Blue Book, um, which were the government's programs to look into UFO reports um, throughout the 50s and 60s. Um, and he actually was the guy who developed the, you know, uh, Close Encounters of the, of the Third Kind. Yes, the, uh, the film. Yeah, Hynek is the guy who developed that classification system of like first kind, second kind, oh. third kind uh, oh. of encounter with extraterrestrials. So uh, cool guy, rest in peace and uh, not appearing anymore in this episode. No, he will because he's, he's <laughs> part of this investigation team. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's get into sightings, right? Because that's what we're here for. Um, the first known sighting of this, I'm going to call it the Hudson Valley boomerang. It can be called the Hudson Valley triangle as well. Um, the first sighting I could find was New Year's Eve, 1982. And I actually have several sightings near to each other, which is always interesting. Cause it's like, Oh, you know, these two people both kind of confirm this was in this area. Um, the first, the writers of the book uh, sometimes give people a uh, an alias if they like if they're uncomfortable being named. So this was a retired New York cop named Tony Valor. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> That's what it says. That's terrific. I can only imagine Tony came up with his own uh, alias and porn name. It <laughs> sounds myself, like Tony Valor. <laughs> it means I have. Vala. <laughs> uh, he was a retired cop in his 40s, so early retiree, but you get a good pension as a cop. And he had just moved to Kent with his wife. I'm not judging his choices. Don't, ju- don't judge him, Carrie. I'm sure they had enough set aside. <laughs> he moved to Kent with his wife and two kids. And just after midnight on New Year's Eve, 1982, Tony Valor cracked open a bottle of bubbly, as you do to celebrate. Um, mm. And then he wandered outside the house. And he... <laughs> And he decided, I guess on his own, uh, that he was going to crack another bottle of champagne on the side of the house to christen it. Yeah, I don't think his wife helped him make that choice. I can tell you for sure that she didn't. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, like you do with a boat. He was like, honey, it's the new house. Christen it. Um, Yeah, he christens the new house. And so he... I see the logic. (laughs) He's so Italian, I can tell. Tony (laughs) Valor. He's the most Italian guy. Tony Valor. We gotta make it nice. Wait, isn't Tony (laughs) Valor... Make it nice. (laughs) Isn't Tony Valor one of your dad's friends from Pelham? Probably. Um, (laughs) We all know Tony Valor. (laughs) So... um, when he shows his wife, look, I, I christened the house. Um, she was pissed at him. <laughs> she was <laughs> she was mad. She was mad about the broken glass, concerned the kids were going to walk out and hurt their feet. Uh, and so she told Tony, go go get a, a dustpan and clean that up right now. And Tony was sweeping glass up in his driveway when he looked up and saw about 15, he said, very bright red, green, and white lights uh, in the this sky. colored. Yeah, it is Christmas colors, and this was right after Christmas. Um, That wasn't Tony's thought because it was so high in the sky, so he thought maybe a large jet in trouble, Um, but it was moving Mm -hmm. too slowly to be any kind of a plane that Tony had ever seen. So he yelled for his wife to grab the movie camera as the lights passed right over the house. 
direct quote from Tony here. He said, It seemed to be connected to some kind of structure. The thing was a boomerang, a V-shape. I could hear a faint, deep hum. Oh! <laughs> Stupid. I don't think he added the O oh at the end. He definitely added the He definitely said O. Oh. He seems like a dice man. To Classic me. Tony Valor. Uh, he, Typical to- Tony Valor. Tony shot film. Tony shot film with the lights about 500 feet over his head. But while overhead, they switched suddenly to three blindingly bright white lights, like searchlights, and then back Ooh. to the colored ones. Um, he showed this video to the investigators who wrote this book, Heineck and Co. Um, they had to admit even, and they are the most rabid of UFO guys, um, that no structure was visible in the, in the photographs they saw. And so except for the lights themselves, the screen was black, but the lights are in kind of a, a boomerang or triangular shape. Hmm. That same night. Edwin Hansen, a 55-year-old warehouse foreman from Kent Cliffs, was driving home on the interstate just a minute or less after Tony had seen his craft. Um, Edwin called it a number of lights that he saw hovering over the highway overhead that he thought was a chopper because there was a searchlight scanning the road below and he saw several cars pulled over at the shoulder. Now, as Edwin slowed down, the cho- the object started making slow, tight circles overhead as it projected that white beam of light onto the onto the road. Hansen thought, God, I wish it would get a little closer so it could get a look. And just then, he said, as if responding to his thoughts, it suddenly turned and descended and started heading toward him. No. That's chilling. I hate it so much. <laughs> He said, it was shaped like a boomerang with lights running up and down its wings. Part of what seemed to be a long triangular tail section loomed behind the boomerang pattern of lights. It was so huge it filled up the entire sky. Mm-mm. Hit the, that, I can't even imagine. That last sentence is, is like a childlike fear sentence. The, it filled up the entire sky. <laughs> I imagine it's like Star Destroyer, that first shot in A New Hope. Yes. Where it's just like... Oh. Psh- Covering the screen the for like, of it, but then all of a sudden it's the whole screen mm-hmm. Ugh. for like thirty seconds. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Hanson blew his horn as on the road frantically. <laughs> I guess trying to scare the sh- the spaceship away. I appreciate that tactic. It, it works on like when a bear comes at you, like oh, I'm bigger than you, bear. Shoot. Yeah, get out of here. Yeah, the aliens are like deer, right? If you just honk, exactly. So you don't want to hit it with your car. <laughs> Um, as the searchlight got closer to the car, though, Edwin felt something like a voice in his head telling him not to be afraid. And we'll hear that uh, a lot in these accounts as well. Then the object suddenly turned and left and the light vanished. Edwin told investigators he had told no one else about this experience. But when they talked to his wife, she reported that for several weeks after this date, Edwin would just walk outside at night staring at the sky. (laughs) Oh, wow. Wow. That'd be disconcerting for her. Like, oh, he's at it again. What is oh what gosh. is he looking at? Yeah. Oh, Edwin. Yikes. I'm sure she thought he was seeing an astronomer or something. <laughs> right. <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> She's boning up. Um, boning down. <laughs> oh, no. Boning down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a little later in 1983, the sighting started to pick up. Uh, Monique O'Driscoll saw the craft on February 26th. Uh, Monique was 38 and worked at a mental health clinic. So, you know, she's not crazy. She was working there. Um, (laughs) She was driving home with her 17-year-old daughter, also named Monique O'Driscoll, um, after dinner with grandma. And the radio started to hiss as they drove. And the static got so loud that Monique turned off the radio. Uh, The book wasn't clear whether that was (laughs) Monique 1 or Monique 2. (laughs) One of the Moniques. (laughs) Um, a Monique. Yes, but certainly daughter Monique turned to mother Monique and said, Mom, look at those lights. And Monique said, well, that must be a house. But as they looked, the lights they were looking at started to move slowly at the level of the treetops, and it became clear they weren't on a hill as, as it had appeared they were. Monique said, what really caught my eye was the brightness of the lights and the way the object was moving so slowly. There must have been 50 of them. She wow. followed this parade of lights a quarter mile to a lake uh, and got out of the car to get a closer look. So she could, it looked like separate objects with their own lights rather than one object with a bunch of lights? She said the object, but there were many lights. Oh, okay. Um, I really appreciate that she drove to a, I presume, more remote location. <laughs> it was like, yes, I shall stand here now. 
Absolutely. See what's what. I'm like, this sounds like a bad idea. She's not seen horror films, has she? <laughs> Her daughter felt the same way because Monique Jr. was going, get back in the car. Get back in the car. Good uh, on Jr. <laughs> Uh, Monique Sr. could see red and blue lights reflecting off the water um, and amber in between. She said there was a big amber light right in the middle. Um, so like right where that laser shot out of the Independence Day uh, ship. Yeah. <laughs> um, three or the four... butthole of the ship. Yes, I think that's the scientific <laughs> term. I believe scientifically. They, they call it three or four minutes later, the object moved on again and Monique felt compelled to follow. Um, as she drove around behind it, she actually met several others in their cars who were also tracking the huge object, um, but they all kind of lost it as it crested over some mountains and um, over the horizon. Monique said it was, quote, bigger than my mother's house, maybe 200 to 300 feet from tip to tip. That's too big. Wow. It's, it's Independence Day. It's like That's Independence too Day. Big. That thing hanging over the White House. <laughs> mm-hmm. The authors relate uh, four other stories of people who saw this particular thing on this particular night, including the stop over the lake where Monique um, said she had watched it for three to four minutes. Um, Also, in March, Monique would see the same ship again while walking her dog, or I should say collection of lights, while walking her dog. Um, And then when she got home from that dog walk, it was an hour later than she thought it was. So, lost time. Oh, mm mm. Mm mm. Now, what happens a lot of times with lost time incidents in UFO, UFO stuff often has lost time. People will see UFOs. We talked about this with Barney and Betty Hill. Mm -hmm. Um, Any listeners who haven't heard that, uh, if you don't know that story, definitely go check (laughs) that out because it's wild. Um, But yeah, what you have is people will see a UFO and then just like this, uh, get home and then realize it's much later than they thought. Where did that time go? Um, sometimes people will lose, you know, days, but more more often it's hours. Um, and o- it often happens right after they see a UFO. The implication, right, is you're probably in that in that spaceship at some point. Um, yeah. And indeed, under hypnosis by the authors of this book, uh, Monique did recall a scene where she was lying down in a large round room with a silver cylinder attached to a mechanical arm on her chest. Mm-hmm. And gray aliens with big bald heads were working at little panels uh, around the room. That was as much as she could uh, uh, recall. Well, uh, they can only do so much in an hour. But then she was screaming for her dog, and then she was back with her dog. Yeah. A happy ending. They can only. They can, <laughs> it is a happy ending. She's back with her dog. Um, her dog. I mean, in the end. But there is a lot of. Um, they call it high strangeness, just anything that's like kind of warping at the edges of reality. Um, there's always a lot of that around UFO stuff, and Hudson Valley is no different. Um, two different women reported to investigators during 1983 that they had been awakened by a bright light shining through their window and then felt unable to move, pinned to the bed, while a sinister voice told them, uh, don't worry, we're just doing tests, you won't be harmed. <laughs> don't worry we're just here to perform some tests it'll be fine it'll be totally fine what is more terrifying than the idea that you are awakened by some bizarre bright light and a voice you cannot see and yet you cannot move that that is that is my nightmare well people uh i've never experienced sleep paralysis but people who do mm, say that's is, terrifying i've only had it once and it was really scary and there's yeah, and there's no alien involved there and it's still horrifying oh yeah like i was i mean what happens is that like you wake up before your body does. So I I was awake and it was morning and it was a beautiful day, but like I couldn't breathe. I couldn't get up. It's very scary because it feels very surreal. I never experienced that. I don't recommend it. It was only (laughs) the one time and that was enough for me. Isn't that where stories of like incubuses and succubuses come from? Yeah, like Uh, they're sitting on your chest because it does feel like you can't, like something's pressing you down. It's... That's fascinating. That's fascinating that there would even be a lag between your body and your mind waking up that would cause that. Because you would think that regardless, you would still be breathing, right? Your body wants that to happen. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, hopefully you never stopped breathing unless you've got really bad apnea. Um, But (laughs) but, but your your body, um, yeah, it's just weird. And I know some people it like happens to chronically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And night terrors is even scarier than that. Yes. We'll do an episode on that someday. I've, I've heard some crazy stories of someone who had night terrors like every night and he would wake up and see Jesus being crucified in his room like it was really happening. 
Oh, crazy. Word. Oh, oh my <laughs> God. Was that man Mel, Mel Gibson? <laughs> then he made that movie? No, that was his Amen. that was his dream, not a nightmare. Um in any case, sightings really picked up in March of nineteen eighty three. That's when on March 26, 1983, the Westchester Rockland Daily Item published the story, Hundreds Claimed to Have Seen UFO. And that story collected accounts from the, mar- the night of March 24th. Uh, investigators Heineck and Imbrogno and Pratt rushed into their cars and uh, headed on up to the Hudson Valley because they needed to get into the thick of this. And uh, when they started asking around, they found that some people had seen the UFO a week before March 24th. Um, There were a number of sightings on March 17th, and I'll get through those first. At 8.40 p.m., Linda Nicoletti, a mom in her mid-30s, looked out her window and saw a big object hovering over I-84. It won't surprise you to know it was V-shaped and had so many lights, she says, it was impossible to count them. They were all colors of the rainbow with one much larger and brighter light in the center underneath. The butthole. The butthole. (laughs) The butthole light. <laughs> Not a direct quote. Linda thought it was an. <laughs> it was the butthole. Linda thought it was an. <laughs> Linda thought it was an airplane um, that was going to crash into the house at first, um, but then it leveled off, turned right, and hovered over the house of her neighbor Dennis Sant. Uh, and Linda could see Dennis in his front yard watching it. She told investigators this, so they were like, "Okay, we got to go talk to Dennis now." Uh, Dennis Sant had been getting home from a church meeting with his kids when they saw it. Uh, The kids jumped out of the car and they all ran to the backyard, but the ship was gone. Uh, Mm. Afterward, he had a strong urge to go outside again. And stare at the sky. And he saw it over the freeway. Uh, And just as he thought, oh, I wish it could get closer. I wish it would get closer. I need a better look at this thing. It turned on a dime and started drifting closer. That's a that's a common thing of, of feeling compelled to go outside and look at the sky in the middle of the night. I think um, when I was watching the documentary uh, that Dan Aykroyd made, he was actually mm. possibly in this area. He was in like upstate New York or something. And he said that um, he, he once like really he woke up in the middle of the night really compelled to go outside and his wife was like, no, 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 don't go outside. And then the next day he found out that it had been like a mass UFO sighting the night before. Wow. So it's a common thing to like get this compulsion to need to go outside. It's like a psychic thing. Yeah. yeah. No, I was just gonna say, and also that, you know, that when this happens, often it seems to like react to your thoughts. Yes. Like, again, that's yeah, psychic yeah. principle. That's what I was gonna say. It's, it's fascinating because part of you says like, oh, are they now, when you hear these voices in your head, are they tuning into me now? But were they tuning into you the entire time? Like, did they know you were there, pulled you out, and that's how you heard the voice to be? Like, that's how early and how do they do it? And can they hear Can they hear everything in your head? Yeah. yeah Hope yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> the, Hate that. They don't like that. Not a, no, not a fan. Uh, mm-hmm. The ship stopped 20 feet above a nearby telephone pole. He said it was about 40 yards across. It was made up of green, white, and red lights from what he could see with an amber light in the middle. The butthole. The butthole. Sant said... (laughs) Sant said, I wasn't... I wasn't really paying attention to my children. (laughs) They... (laughs) Classic New York dad. They seemed to have gone inside... (laughs) And I watched it alone with my dad for approximately another two minutes when we started to walk underneath it. It seemed to be about the width of a football field and was a dark, very gray metal. It was so close, you could hit it with a baseball. I think he's just bragging about his arm at the end there. But... Yeah. Yeah. It's like, wow, look at that. Classic New York dad. Where are my kids at? <laughs> yeah, he just loses track of the kids immediately. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Thinks about baseball. Yeah, typical. <laughs> Uh, He said the ship then made a sweep of nearby willow trees, then came back to almost settle in his backyard again, then flew away. Hmm. Drivers on I-84 that night confirmed they had seen the thing and it had caused some traffic. Uh, Truck driver William Durkin, who, get this, what a lucky witness, doubles as a private pilot, was driving his car not far from uh, Dennis Sant. Durkin said... Several people were driving a red. Hold on, let me. What's a what's a pilot slash truck driver sound like? 
Sev- <clears throat> Several people were driving erratically. All seemed to be watching the lights. Traffic in the opposite lanes was coming to a halt as the lights approached and people were getting out of their cars. Um, <laughs> so oh, what? We'll, takes. Ah, we'll be getting into Florida any moment now. <laughs> <laughs> See, so I, it was evocative. Uh, <laughs> So William Durkin got out of his truck, and he said he could see some type of dark pipe-like structure connecting the lights. Not just lights, something behind them. He said, Mm -hmm. they were right over my head, and I couldn't hear any sound. Until he heard another guy go, my God, it's a UFO! (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Which he did. (laughs) Astute. Uh, The craft then made several tight... Slow circles, and Durkin said he was sure it wasn't a type of craft he was familiar with. Then it hovered a second time, now just over a truck near Durkin's car, hopefully the same guy who yelled, My God! (laughs) Uh, And it just hit this truck with a spotlight for several seconds. The truck threw itself into gear and sped away. Well, didn't the driver threw the truck into gear and sped away? (laughs) And then the craft... (laughs) Then the craft was seemingly satisfied with its work because it just drifted off toward Connecticut around 8.55 p.m. Huh. An electrical engineer in Danbury, Connecticut, did see it around 9.10 as he was coming home from a church meeting um, with his wife. And uh, they thought it was planes, um, but he did think uh, this guy, Don Odenkirk... This 44-year-old electrical engineer. Not Bob Odenkirk. Don't give me that look. I, it's I'm, not Mr. Like, Show. Really, it's a Bob? <laughs> Mr. Show's brother. Um, he said, um, I see formation flights all the time in this area, but there was something different about this. It was really puzzling because when the lights began to turn, they all turned at once. Mm. You know, because yeah. obviously if it was one thing you would see. Right. Everything moves. Right, that makes time. sense. I see. I love every time someone sees something, they always have to like make sure like they're the expert of the thing. Like, I've seen many things. Well, this was different. This than was all a things. weird thing. <laughs> this is the weird thing. No. It's established that I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is my first thing. No, no one's bigger on that than the authors of this book, honestly, because every witness they're like, um, even if it's not something to do with the case, they're always they, they make sure to go like respected member of the community and uh, uh, the counter clerk, this guy, or a doctor. And, uh, you know, uh, they they emphasize over and over again that these are like professionals with more to lose than to gain uh, from crazy stories and that they're educated people. Um, and then, yeah, they, they do give they mention every time somebody has airplane experience. Or, oh, yes. Well, th- that happened in New England UFOs as well. Like, Because you would think that they know what they're talking about. So maybe it does lend a little more credence. And instead of being like uh, this guy who lives in the woods, you know. Yeah, Yeah, that makes sense. So that was the 17th. But March 24th was the big one when hundreds of police calls and sightings uh, came into police, mostly in Yorktown. Um, Several of the witnesses were Yorktown police. Um. Mm. Actually, from 8.20 to 9.30 p.m., the Yorktown 911 switchboard was overloaded with calls. Would you say Yorktown was turned upside down? (laughs) Uh, The the whole world was. And you guessed it. The calls were about a large, low-flying, boomerang-shaped UFO with red, blue, and green lights. Uh, Police reports from that night list the object as unknown. But a later statement from the police said it was probably light aircraft flying in formation. Um, However, some officers allegedly called Pratt and Ambrogno, the authors of this book, and said they saw the thing hover and, quote, airplanes don't hover. (laughs) That's a quote from one of the officers. Uh, That's that's fair. fair. Yeah, that's fair enough. They don't hover. So March 24th, this is the, the this is really the, the the bulk of the sightings right here in this one night. So I do want to um, get through the timeline a little and bit. And what year is this? 1983. Is... Okay. Uh, so at 7.30 p.m. in Bedford, a corporate exec- executive named Hunt Middleton was getting off a bus around... Uh, <laughs> what's that what's that shake in your know. head the the first name hunt is just it's so bougie he's a he's a new york corporate executive exactly. what do you want he's getting off bougie. a bus well he, he but he's riding a bus home to bedford so who knows hmm. i wonder if he dropped the tur from his name because it was hunter he's like no not the R. maybe it was a chartered bus maybe it's his private bus oh it's mm. his private bus <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's getting off his bus in bedford 
in his garage. I like to call this <laughs> the Hunt Express. Uh, the Hunted. <laughs> the Hunter. He, you know, Hunt the uses that line with the ladies. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Hunt said there were perhaps six or seven very, very bright lights blinking, blinking red, green, white, and blue. So they've added blue into the equation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, canonically now. It's just <laughs> just once the last time. Um, Hunt said, it was just hovering there in the sky. I tried listening for a sound, but heard nothing. The lines looked like they were in a straight line, but you could tell they extended around in sort of a half circle. I don't know if he means from perspective or something. Mm-hmm. Um, at 8 p.m., half an hour later, the lights were seen in Carmel, 10 miles to the north. Uh, computer consultant Steve Whittles was entertaining three friends at his house, and he looked out the window to see a half circle of red and white lights. Um, the guys ran outside as it drifted away slowly. But moments later, a quarter mile away from his house, Dr. Lawrence and Joan Greenman and their kids were watching TV when they saw the same thing through their window. Uh, Joan ran to get the binoculars. That's a cool mom. She said uh, they could see some type of metallic part connecting the lights. Um direct quote from Joan now, the object turned a little bit, and I could see it was a wide V shape. I then saw a very brilliant white beam of light come down from the center, and in that bright light, a small reddish object came down and headed very, very fast toward the north. Then, the beam of light shut off. Hmm. So that's weird. Yeah. It's like it's sending a little probe <laughs> out or something. It's a little drone. Um, we'll come back to the probe, maybe, uh, in a little bit. Oh, I hope we do. <laughs> At 8.30 p.m., it was in Westchester County, and this was this was the big one, right? Because Yorktown is in Westchester County, uh, to my understanding. I'm not a local. <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> I accept that. <laughs> my geography's uh, rusty. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were, as I said, well over 1,000 sightings in the Millward, in the Millwood, Yorktown area on this night. Um Ed Burns, an IBM program manager. See, they always like to tell you how um, qualified these guys are. How techy they are. It's like they wouldn't have put some dummy in charge of the programs. (laughs) Uh, They got a lot of programs. I don't know. Um, He was driving north when he saw this thing off to his right. Um, Near Millwood, there were 12 cars pulled off to the side of the road. So Ed pulled off to... Um, he said he was. Ra- hey, is there a party going on? He said he was rambling excitedly about the ship the entire time he was standing next to some stranger, <laughs> just going like, "Isn't this really cool? Oh man, I can't believe we're seeing this ship!" And he said the guy just glanced at him once, and other than that, just wordlessly stared at the sky. Oh, God, <laughs> with New York, he was offering that as like evidence of high strangeness, I think. But it, 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 he might have just been an, an annoying guy, right? <laughs> Maybe. <Yeah. laughs> Maybe. Um, Ed said it hovered overhead like, quote, like it was observing us as we were observing it. Then the ship slowly Mm. zigzagged out of sight. It was gigantic. He said, if there is such thing as a flying city, this was a flying city. It was not a small craft. It was huge. (laughs) It was huge. Um, The traffic was snarled on major streets in Yorktown and all the way down the Taconic Parkway, which is always a joy anyway. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> as people pulled over to look. Um, for those who aren't in the tri-state area, the Taconic and Merritt Parkway is two lanes and unlit, and it's um, it's bad at any time of day. <laughs> it's trash. Yeah. It's trash. Uh, the Merritt is very pretty. It's beautiful. But, They've... I mean, you're going to really take in those surroundings because you will be in traffic. <laughs> well, plenty of time to look at those bridges. Everyone is unique. <laughs> yes. At 8.30 p.m., at the same time, Sightings were also made in Putnam County, which is 15 miles north of Westchester County. So that would seem to, you know, imply at least there were at least two of these things flying around on this night. Hmm. The ones seen in Putnam County were similar, but apparently smaller. And there were less sightings, but many were close encounters, which is to say within 500 feet of the object. Hmm. James Holtzman, his wife Ruth, and their two sons were driving home to Kent on Route 301 when they say when they saw red, green, blue, and white lights 300 feet over the trees. The lights were so bright they lit the treetops. They were silent and hovering. Holtzman got out of his car again for some reason. <laughs> Enough, I probably would. Um, I would too. You know that. <laughs> you know. That. But but I don't. I don't think it's an alien. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they all say at first. And uh, then you lose nine minutes. 
an oncoming motorist stopped and uh, got out of his car. And then the lights in the ship flashed in a crazy sequence up and down the wings, and the guy who had just stopped sped away. Uh, (laughs) And then at this point, Holtzman's wife and kids were pleading with him, and so uh, he got out of there, too. Hmm. It's Uh, interesting, too, that so many of these involve, like, I guess it goes to credibility as well, but, like, families. Yeah, multiple people. These are family people. They're responsible. Yes, well, and you've got, look, you can ask their kids. They were there, too. It's just You don't believe Monique? Ask Monique. (laughs) Um, just like in Westchester and everywhere else all of these Putnam County sightings were a triangle or boomerang of lights doing uh, often doing tight slow circles and sometimes running a searchlight along the ground Hmm. at nine o'clock back in Westchester County this is the 24th still yes Good God. Yeah, this is still on the 24th. This is only 9 p.m. Jesus. Newcastle police started getting calls about the UFO. They dismissed them at first, but quickly there were too many to ignore. Officer Andy Sadoff estimates the thing that she saw was 300 feet from end to end and moved smoothly as if it was gliding. She saw white white lights on top and green on the bottom. Quoting Officer Sadoff here, Later on, they told us the lights were nothing but ultralight airplanes. I said, no, this could not have been ultralights. This was impossible. What I saw was one object, very huge. Hmm. Bookkeeper Gloria Scalzo was driving north on the Taconic at 8.55 when she spotted them and watched for a while, and then she actually got off the highway and made a U-turn to go and follow them some more for a little while. Uh, So people are, like, strangely compelled. She, too, said she was just like, I couldn't help but follow it. I had to go after it. So that's strange. Uh, By 9.30, it was in Putnam County where Tom Richmond and his eight-year-old daughter saw a boomerang of Greek Greek lights. Greek light yogurt. Low fat. (laughs) Uh, Of green lights over Kirk Lake. Said Tom, I heard a very faint humming sound. I was very amazed at how slowly it was moving. Finally, the lights made it to Connecticut again, where Danbury IBM exec Robert Golden was watching the lights hover over his pine trees. He said it was easily larger than a 747, and it was just hanging around out there as if it was tied to a string. Like a kite. Yeah, like a kite. It's interesting how these are usually like super fast or or unnaturally slow to the point where they're just kind of hovering in the air. Yeah. Mm. It's weird. <laughs> um, yeah, well, fast is pretty rare, although sometimes they will vanish. Well, they'll like zip, sometimes they zip around and then they, yeah, they just pop out of view or something. Yeah, but these or ones. They move in ways, yeah, like they zigzag across yeah. the sky, right? How yes. often do you see a plane zigzag? Exactly. Yeah, but, but it's always a slow, it's always a slow zigzag. This guy likes to drift. There are UFOs that move fast, but not. Uh, That's in Valley, Tokyo Drift. I just, oh my God, I you. I was going to be free. I couldn't get to the joke as quick as you did for some reason. It was just a delay. I was like, say that, say that, say that pun. No, okay. <laughs> um, there were more witnesses on March 26th of 1983 and in July and August of that year as far away as Sandy Hook and Bridgeport, Connecticut. Ayo. Um, Bridgeport. But once the months got colder, once we got into deep fall, uh, things slowed down and then dropped off altogether. Unless people outside, maybe. To see stuff. Less aliens outside. Maybe they can't get the right atmospheric <laughs> readings. Unless it's uh, Zeep Zorp, it's too chilly. Um, I was going to say, they're no fools. They don't want to be here in the winter either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. The sightings dropping off during the winter months uh, also might play into one of the more popular theories about um, what this could be. And um, we'll get into that as well as, of course, the inevitable return of the sightings the following year uh, when we return. Ooh. Ooh. A woman is found in a well 11 days after she's supposed to elope, and it ignites the first murder trial in U.S. history. One of the oldest buildings in New York is the home to an old ghost and plenty of terrifying stories. The daughter of a former vice president and one of the most famous murderers in U.S. history goes missing while sailing- Adam, what are you doing? 
Well, Christina, I'm doing the trailer for our podcast. No, no, no. We agreed it was going to be fun and lively, like the show, with plenty of character voices. Oh, no, no, no. No voices. Oh, there would be plenty of voices. Fine. Have it your way. Join us each week on the New York Mystery Machine, where we explore the biggest unsolved murders, hauntings, disappearances, and more. Hosted by me, Adam Mace. And me, Christina Marinelli. Available every Monday on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast from. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at New York Mystery Machine and Twitter at New York Mysteries. The New York Mystery Machine. Get, Get on, on board! board. The I haven't really woken up oh, until I've had my McDonald's breakfast deal. And I know this is true because before breakfast, I put my phone in the refrigerator and couldn't find the keys that were already in my hand. Nothing gets the morning going like the first sip of an iced coffee. Get any size and any flavor for 99 cents until 11 a.m. Price and participation may vary. McDonald's. I'm loving it. Welcome back. When last we left you, we had just run down the really sort of, uh, I don't know, jarring, uh, frightening, uh, extreme. How would you guys describe the UFO sightings of 1983 in the Hudson Valley? Deeply horrifying. (laughs) With some Christmas flair. Christmas flair. A lot of Christmas flair. (laughs) And a very respectable uh, audience of uh, businessmen, bookkeepers. Who are completely sober. Completely sober. Well, most of them were sober. Not Tony Valor. Well, you know, he's retired. (laughs) He's retired. He's not going to go to work tomorrow. I got nothing to do tomorrow. (laughs) He's walking on broken glass all over his... uh, (laughs) Walking walking on broken glass. You have to pay for that now? Oh, sorry, Damn, guys. sorry. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, we're, we're under 30 seconds. It's okay. It's okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, now, you might think, again, with, with such attribution on people having seen this thing, it's like, well, obviously, obviously there was something there, right? And um, yeah. it sort of demands explanation from someone, and, and certainly people are going to look to the local authorities uh, for an answer as to what they saw, right? Especially after mm. it goes big in the papers. Military stuff like that um so well, no no i just mean they're gonna ask the police hey well, yeah, what was it but like maybe you know try and see if it's some sort mm. of military exercise and nearby plane fields or whatever yeah like we have sikorsky over here i would probably ask them question mark i don't know <laughs> now the working police theory at the time and the one that they promulgated with the public uh was that there was a group of ultralight airplane enthusiasts um, flying their planes in formation, possibly out of the Stormville airfield in Dutchess County, New York. Wouldn't they have like a log of that? Right. You can't just fly randomly. You have they all to have like them parked in the garages. You have to be okay to fly. Well, See, there the... has to be a log of that if they're if there's like a dozen guys in their I... tiny airplanes. I've looked into this, and I'll I'll get into it uh, more later, but. There are definitely, it was popular to fly light, light airplanes out of uh, an airport nearby, for sure. Huh. Right, but you would think that there's a log from that day of like a dozen dudes and a dozen different planes doing this. But they were all do- always doing it all the time. Uh, but, but also, you don't, you don't have to like, you don't have to like sign out your airplane. You own an airplane. No, but you, you have, go- they have to have like a record of what you're doing. You have to get like air traffic control and like, okay to be in. I don't know if there is air traffic control at a really, really, really small airport like that. Or I don't know if they're keeping logs. There ha- there has to be something. You can't just fly in the, in a, in a craft. Okay. Willy nilly or I'll, else you could crash into something. I have comments from the FAA for you a little later. Well, I say BS to that FAA. For now, all I can say is that around the same time the UFO star- calls started jumping up, um, at night, during the daytime, there would be calls about low-flying formations of aircraft buzzing people's homes in Putnam and Dutchess counties. Both started ticking up around the same uh, time. 
so police pointed to that and said, well, obviously this is the same thing. You're seeing lights of airplanes. They're, they're flying close together. They're doing it very well. And that's it. However, uh, immediately, J. Allen Hynek and his... Uh, I'm not calling Hynek a crony, but these other two are cronies. J. Allen Hynek and his, uh, his cronies, bros. his bros, uh, said, well, first of all, ultralights are unstable. Their tiny aircraft, keeping them on a straight line is difficult. And that makes sense, right? I mean, picture trying to yeah. keep like a 747 in line and then uh, picture if it was a really, really light, uh, you know, it's basically a glider with a with a jetpack on it. <laughs> Barf. Mm. I hate flying. Uh, and so the idea that you could fly five or six of them in formation is hard to believe uh, for the authors. Anyway, They also wondered how an ultra light plane, quote unquote, could possibly lift the lighting equipment, and the power source that the authors imagined would be required for the lights. Or fill up the sky. Or what? Fill up the sky. How could ultralights fill up the sky? Yeah, the guy, the guy was like, oh, I couldn't see anything else in the sky. Yeah, it was I, football fields wide. That, I, that guy might have been, that might have been but, childlike fear. <laughs> but, That's why I said that. But most, multiple people had said that it was like huge. Even if... Even if it was 300 feet across and like pretty low, even if it was what they said, um, I think they said you could blot it out of the sky with your hand held like here. Like it was a large object in the sky. Here but it wasn't... is about what, like six, six oh, inches from your forehead? Yeah, maybe six inches from my forehead. Uh, it wasn't filling up your entire field of vision. Hmm. Well, I don't know. I wasn't there. No, I know. But <laughs> but nobody else's account says that guy definitely does say that. But nobody else says uh, it was filling up the sky. Um. Anyway. Well, one of them was like, it's a floating city or whatever. Yes. That, that that's was a true. different person. Another person said it was like multiple football fields. That's, that's true. I think that's bigger than an ultralight aircraft. But every time or I, several of them. <laughs> yeah. Or several of them. Uh. The authors also point out that a formation of ultralights would sound like a, quote, squadron of lawnmowers. These are like hmm. things with engines. They're not silent like the ships have been described. Um, however, there definitely were, they say, mystery flyers out there. And Heineck and his friends thought those mystery flyers were probably doing it on purpose to try to discredit the UFO reports. Hmm. The book says some witnesses said the planes that they saw were flown with precision and expert pilots must have been at the controls. Do you see how they're hurting their own argument here and they don't even know it? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of bizarre to argue that no, 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 there were UFOs and also fake UFO lookalikes. And listen, these guys were great pilots, so they uh, but but not good enough to fly these ultralights in formation. No one could do that. Hmm. Um. And here's here's where he does the like a recent president I can think of. He puts the words in other people's mouths or um, the announcers on Lucha Underground. Um, <laughs> Similar vibe. <laughs> many witnesses believed the appearance of these planes was a deliberate attempt to confuse the issue, to damage the credibility of UFO reports and convince people who had witnessed the UFO that they had really seen airplanes. Many witnesses. Many, said. many people are saying. Um, it must be made clear that these mystery pilots were not the private pilots we tracked down in the Stormville area. These mystery pilots possibly represented some unknown government agency. You know, I've, this is, I, I want to say it was in one of the Bud Hopkins books that I read for something else once that also talked about like the idea that there are also elements in society who want to make everyone who experiences this look crazy so they do these things like so a men in black vibe mm -hmm. yeah and and um there was a great oh who did i i i promote other people's podcasts <laughs> that we don't know too much on this but uh <laughs> unbelievable did that great thing on tom delong and um what was that story they connected it to oh it was um because it was a documentary on amazon that they were talking about, about how government agents would try to discredit people and make them look crazy. Yeah, they like they, they would deliberately make UFO people look crazier, for sure. They would they would go out of their way to discredit them. Um, so is it insane? No, absolutely not, that the government could have planes out there. But but it's a weird... It, it kind of colors the issue. It complicates the issue. Um, and as I said, the... 
sightings had quieted down for the entire winter of 1983 into 1984, and all the way until March 25th of 1984. Ironically, the same desk sergeant was on duty as had been on March 24th of 1983 when the calls started coming in again. Late March, it's a spooky this poor time. Guy. <laughs> uh-huh. The same guy, and he 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 goes to like the dispatcher lady. He was like, oh, "Alice, the UFOs are back." You know, it was like, "Ah, <laughs> oh, geez." Um, to the moon, Alice. It was once again the same thing. <laughs> Large object, multicolored lights, low altitude. Um, we don't know they're from the moon, Carrie. <laughs> uh, the reporter dispatch the next day said the UFOs are back and they're right on schedule. <laughs> Uh, there were f- yeah. fewer witnesses this time. It was a Sunday night, to be fair. <laughs> but uh, 200 to 300 people saw the uh, craft. Still a lot. It still <laughs> is a lot. Uh, at 8.20, it was seen over the Taconic Parkway, once again. Um, <laughs> Michael Piazza, not that Michael Piazza. <laughs> uh, <laughs> legendary. Everyone's <laughs> catcher. <laughs> huh? <laughs> we have a catcher? <laughs> Saw Hall of Famer Mike Piazza. <laughs> yep, he saw a delta shaped uh, ship with six white. He didn't see see a ship. He saw a delta shape of six white lights and uh, two green in the middle. What's a delta shape? Uh, delta is like a triangle. Okay. I, don't, I don't know why he said delta. He's a fancy boy. He really likes Greek. <laughs> He's like, He's not Greek. <laughs> like, oh, it's delta. You mean triangle? <laughs> no, I mean delta. delta. That's where the triangle came from. <laughs> No, Lloyd, I mean Delta. (laughs) Um, Mike Galley saw two layers of lights from the Taconic. He said it was red on the top, but white on the bottom. Um, Christine Fisher and her family saw the lights flashing red to white. Hmm. Uh, Once again, the thing seemed to head up the Taconic and the Merritt and into Connecticut uh, because Danbury police got many calls this night again as well. And uh, Danbury police specifically told one caller reportedly, Okay, go sleep it off, and the pink UFO will go away. (laughs) The pink UFO. How clever, mixing red with white. So smart. (laughs) I thought it was just a pink elephant's reference, like the guy's drunk. Oh, I don't know. That's a very old, like, Looney Tunes reference. Yeah. Um, On May 31st, 1984, it was seen again. Again by a bunch of people. Dozens this time. Mostly seen near the Taconic. Uh, it was always described as a V-shaped series of lights, slowly moving overhead, making little to no sound. There were more sightings, June 11th, 14th, and 22nd. And then on July 12th, it seemed to really have come to our neck of the woods here, Carrie. Hundreds of sightings in Connecticut on July 12th. Uh, in Danbury, Ridgefield, New Fairfield, New Milford, as well as Westchester, Putnam, and Dutchess counties in New York. Danbury... Elsa. Yeah. Uh, Danbury police alone got 75 calls uh, that night and 12 officers in Danbury reported seeing it. <laughs> These Danbury police are so sick of this shit by now. <laughs> so over these UFOs. <laughs> These are the same police who like a month ago were like, yeah, don't worry about the pink elephants, lady. <laughs> Um, most of these sightings in Connecticut on this night were a circular ring of lights. Uh, oh. which, yeah, which is interesting. It's, uh, that's different, right? Like it's, it's not, it's not, it's not a Delta shape. It's not, it's not a boomerang. It's not a V it's now a circle of lights. Um, this doesn't slow our authors down whatsoever. They say this further confirmed what we already knew. The object or objects can vary in appearance. <laughs> We knew that. <laughs> there we go. So it's not something different than we thought. It's definitely the same thing. And now we know it can shape shift. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the newspaper published uh, the investigators contacts, contact information uh, when they published the story about the UFOs and um, f- calls flooded in with more reports for the investigators. Mm. Uh, they estimate that 5,000 people saw it on this night, July 12th, um, 1984. Wow. Hmm. Dozens more. It is right. Five thousand in a night. That's That's not. That's not confirmed. Like police sightings or anything. That's what. uh, That's what our author friends estimate. But it's it's. I trust them. It's a wild number. Yeah. Um. July nineteenth saw dozens more sightings in Connecticut. Uh. July twenty fourth saw a very dramatic one at the Indian Point nuclear reactor. I think we might have talked about this. 
a little bit in New England UFOs. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. Um, see if this rings a bell for you, then. Uh, a security guard named Carl says that he saw 10 or more lights in a boomerang pattern while on patrol on July 19th. And on that night, he and some con ed people from the plant next door and some security backup watched it for about 15 minutes, hovering just motionless there in the sky uh, for 10 of those. And then it left. He said less than 10 miles an hour because he was walking right underneath it for part of it. On the 24th, another guard went, hey, here's that UFO again. Uh, and they saw the, here was the craft again, lights in a semicircle, not a V, not a circle, a semicircle. Not a delta. Not a delta. There's no point. Blinking yellow, then white, then blue, with a red blinking light pretty far to the rear, he said. Um, and it got close, it got to about 500 feet away from them. Carl said, it looked like an ice cream cone. <laughs> You could see it was a solid body, about the size of three football fields. Moving slowly enough, he could walk under it to keep up. Uh, it was moving slowly enough that he could walk underneath and keep keep up with it. Um, he got within 30 feet. Nope. The ship got within 30 feet of the reactor as guards stood very nervously with their shotguns ready to shoot, to shoot at the spaceship. 30 feet of the reactor. That's what you want to hear. Yeah. There it, are a lot of stories about... Um, UFO sightings at nuclear reactors. Um, really? The, uh, it draws a power. Yeah. Well, some people theorize. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm doing that again. Some people say. <laughs> a lot um, of people are saying. But some people theorize that they kind of use them to charge up and like get like Ooh. leech energy. I think uh, the Rendlesham Forest incident in England. Yes. It's a really famous one. They were um, military guys, I think, looking after like a nuclear reactor. And yeah. and that's kind of what they thought was that it was taking the power from it. Would you say so. the aliens are power hungry? <laughs> <laughs> power mad. I'll say myself out, don't mind me. <laughs> um, power hungry, like, you know. Like, they're <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're mad with power. And, <laughs> and they need that power. And they need that power. And one go. Oh, also, this was the only reactor that was running that night nearby. Like there were several other reactors. I just mentioned Con Ed. Um, it was the only one that was on. So like the uh, this guy Carl was like, they picked the right one. Like if they were looking for a for a power plant, wow. it was like they were attracted to it. Um, another guard who was inside at the time said that he had. They were like, hey, pan that camera around. A security camera. He said he had to pan the camera almost 180 degrees to see the whole structure. Um, he said it was one solid, one solid structure and very large. We had it on camera for about 15 minutes. I was trying to think of some logical explanation for it was, but I didn't know. I would love to see that footage. Absolutely. Yes. And I don't know that it exists. I, I tried to scare that up. Trust me. But uh, <laughs> well, maybe in the, the government archives or whatever. Yeah. All of the video that is mentioned in this book is kind of hard to, to try to track down. Uh, there are videos of lights in the sky in the Hudson Valley uh, on YouTube. There's lots of that. But a lot of it's more recent and shot with a cell phone. Mm -hmm. uh, in August, not this August, 1984. <laughs> Um, Pratt, Imbrogno, and Hynek started putting together a conference of the UFO witnesses so they could gather as much of this information as they could. This is like, this is like prom for them. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is very exciting. When you're a UFO researcher, there's not that many events. They're just cons. You got to go to convention to convention. Yeah. And so they're, they're putting together a con uh, of UFO witnesses. They're bringing in the vendors. They're setting up the wall of Funko Pops. Um... <laughs> The, the venue they picked, and this is a very ufologist venue, uh, was Henry Wells Middle School in Brewster, New York. They thought the auditorium there would do nicely. <laughs> um, as it turned out, by the way, this thing was a big hit, and the auditorium was like not nearly enough capacity. There were people waiting outside and stuff. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, but while they were planning in the lead up to the event, their office got some oddball callers. And when, um, J. Alec, when J. Allen Hynek calls someone an oddball caller... <laughs> Uh, they're not, they're not normal. Uh, one computer voice warned them to stop dealing with forces you have no control over and warned the investigators that they would be hurt if they continued. Oh, uh -huh. oh my. They bravely sallied forth <laughs> uh, and they pat themselves on the back for it uh, quite a bit in the book. Um, another caller said, 
We will meet you on August 25th at 2200 hours at the 120 radial vector of Kingston and the 220 radial of Carmel at Angels 2. This is the We People. The We People? <laughs> this is the We People. W-E-E, like, oh, the little people. And then they hung this up. This is the We People. <laughs> and they just hung up. Um, the investigators thought, well, this is probably a joke. But they had to check it out. It was the night of the conference, though, so it was a really tough... <laughs> call so one of their investigators i have to imagine this is just like the intern yeah uh they sent out investigator fred dennis oh man i never get to go to any of these things so he misses the conference (laughs) and fred had to just stand there and wait for this like uh contact to show up at the appointed um those were air coordinates apparently by the way um and obviously nothing happened. Well, maybe they <laughs> just... were too wee. They couldn't find him. No, Fred just stood out there all day and missed the convention. Poor Fred. Poor, Poor Fred. Fred. Man, that's the real victim in this story. I agree. I've been trying to say that this whole time. <laughs> if there's one victim in this entire story, it's, <laughs> Fred. it's Fred. It's Fred. Finally, the day for the conference came, and the investigators heard dozens of new reports of sightings throughout August and July that they hadn't even heard of. So um, they thought that things were really slowing down, as they had last summer, Um, But it turned out that... They just hadn't heard it. They just hadn't heard it. People were forgetting to contact the investigators. (laughs) Or the newspapers were just taking it for granted at at that point. But there were... I was going to say, everyone's just getting used to it. But there were dozens of sightings that they didn't even know about, and plenty of photos that they could compare, and um, they felt that it was a, a roaring success. Now, also on August 25th of 1984, uh, Jeffrey Schmaltz of the New York Times uh, published a piece called Strange Sights Brighten the Night Skies Upstate, which is one of the uh, biggest um, kind of pops that this story got in in mainstream media. Um, The article quotes a Sergeant Kenneth G. Spiro of Troop K from New York State Police. And Sergeant Spiro said that one state trooper did actually follow the triangle to where it came from. And he says, quote, he tracked it to Stormville Airport. It was a group of light planes. They fly in formation. The undersides and under the wings are painted black so they can't be seen from the ground. The planes are rigged with bright lights so they can turn from one color to another. It's the lights that give shape to a UFO. The trooper spoke to a couple of the pilots, and they're getting a big kick out of it. There's no violation of the law here. Uh, Now, however, I should point out the article also quotes a witness as saying, Oh, I've seen those jerks five or six times. They were nothing like like what I saw the first time. Nothing at all. Hmm. Hmm. So, take that for what what you will. Um, Just as a fun note, that article also quotes the FAA as saying... Why would we care about a UFO? If the pilot's up there with a clearance and at the right altitude, we don't care what planet he comes from. <laughs> okay. That's, just... that's Most of these that's aren't. <laughs> that's very flip. Um, the FAA went on to say in a serious way that pilots are allowed to fly as close together as they feel safe, and in a sparsely populated area, they're allowed to do it as low as 500 feet. Huh. Okay. That's... All right. Um, so that was that, uh, Discover Magazine also did an article cause now this was kind of, kind of a trendy thing to talk about in 1984 on a national level. And, uh, in Discover's article, they managed to get some info on this informal flying club who apparently started calling themselves the Martians after the, after they heard about all these UFO sightings. <laughs> Um, quoting Discover now, several years ago, it seems, a few of the Stormville pilots began practicing formation flying, first in daylight, then, as their skills improved, at night. Before long, other pilots joined them, and what began as a loose groupings of planes became tight formations of aircraft with as little as six inches between wingtips. Um, that wasn't the end of the sightings. More were seen in 1985 and 1986. Uh, dozens more, in fact. And I have a full list of them at the back of this book. Um, but it's really, it is it is more of the same. So I'm not going to read off all of them to you because it's, uh, it is always massive triangle. Uh, lights, well, usually a triangle, occasionally a circle or semicircle. Um, sometimes there's a tail of a couple of lights. Usually it's just the one shape. Um... Sometimes they cast a spotlight around, and they certainly like making those tight circles. Uh, Oh, and it's always moving very slowly. Hmm. I did a little reading into um, ultralights. And the only other thing I'll add is this. And I know you guys... Carrie already knows this, but I'm the guy who always... I'm here to throw uh, throw cold water on everything. (laughs) Um, But that doesn't mean... 
it doesn't mean it's fake. It just means that I, I I'm going to tell you why I think it's fake. Then you guys can tell me, you guys can tell me what you, what you think. Um, so the, the thing that I was thinking was the, the most surprising was the hovering, the silent hovering people kept saying, because airplanes have to keep moving because if they don't, they fall, they fall stall and they fall out of the sky. Um, so every airplane design has a, a minimum speed that it needs to be going at to, to stay aloft. Um, by definition, to be an ultralight airplane, your top speed has to be lower than 55 knots, which is about 63 miles an hour, which is less mm-hmm. than I drive on the Merit, usually. Uh, yeah. And you have to have a stall speed no higher than 24 knots. So all uh, ultralight planes can go like below 28 miles an hour if they want to. Uh, just for comparison, a 747's average cruising speed is 580 miles an hour. And uh, a Cessna Skyhawk, that's a much smaller uh, single-engine plane, uh, cruises at about 142 miles an hour. Uh, so I just feel like if you see something in the sky moving 28 miles an hour, and you're used to seeing things in the sky moving at 500 miles an hour, it, it might look stationary. Right. What, uh, would would the, the slowness cancel out some of the sound, too? Is that the thinking? Uh, I just, on that, the best I can do on that is that it's a smaller engine than a, an airplane would be, obviously, so it's less noise. Yeah. But there would be noise. There's, yeah, and there's still, there's a bunch of them, now, some theoretically, of, and they are flying low. Yes. Now, some of, but low is still a thousand feet. You know, I don't know if, if a plane... Mm. I can hear planes up in the sky. <laughs> I can hear planes up in the sky. <laughs> yeah, but those are 747s. Right, but I'm, I'm, they're much, much, much higher. So you would think like if there's a half a dozen to a dozen of these things all flying low, all yes. together, you would hear it. The, the, the sound is the biggest thing probably. Well, And, the fact and that no one has heard the sound? And some people saw structure behind the lights as well, but they could have just been seeing some plane right and, mm-hmm. and thinking this was mm-hmm. like a lattice work structure um it's the sound thing but some of the witnesses did say they heard a sound but a very low sound um so i don't know they might just be quiet it's not like every time somebody uh, starts a lawnmower up in your neighborhood it's like what was that <laughs> you can hear it but it's like a background buzz um and finally i'll just say that it's a stunning coincidence that these sightings have been so concentrated, so grouped in an area and at a time when we know this flying was happening. Mm-hmm. But keep in mind, um, this is just the the apex of the sightings. Um, there was just a documentary that came out on Discovery Plus where they were investigating Hudson Valley UFOs that are more recent. And um, there have been thousands of reported sightings within the last few years alone. So I doubt that this is the same group of ultralight aircraft still 30 years later or whatever. Um, So, I mean, it's it's never gone away is the thing. This is just the biggest time. Possibility that the aliens Mm -hmm. are timing themselves with the pilots, not Mm. the pilots trying to make it look like a hoax. I like this. Trixie aliens. I like this. The aliens are like, well, listen, there's a little nuclear. We ne- just need nuclear power wherever it is. Right. So we know there's a little around there. And there's also all these dum-dums flying their planes. Um, that's <laughs> good cover. In. It's the perfect yeah. cover. I love it. I like that. I like solid that. alien thoughts. <laughs> solid. A- hashtag solid alien thoughts. Um, but as Carrie alluded to, this certainly wasn't the end of the... Um, strangeness the high strangeness even uh and the ufo activity around hudson valley so um do you guys want to give us a preview of what we're hearing about next week uh, over at new york mystery machine sure we are going to take a deep dive into one man's abduction story and this is um a one of the tales of abduction that really helps popularize um, one of the books that helped popularize the the sort of tropes of abduction that we think of when we think of alien abduction. So, love it. And this is Whitley Stryber. This is Whitley Stryber. Love him. Yay. Uh, he's a uh, he's he's a fun man. I'm I'm really really <laughs> looking forward to uh, to that, and I'm I'm looking forward to um, stepping into your dojo for next week. <laughs> 
Um, let's you, see. Do you guys have anything else? That you, oh no, you were. I, Nat, this no, was no, the, no. I'm, I'm laughing because Adam. Adam is dancing. Oh, I'm <laughs> dojoing. Dojoing. I'm karateing. I see. I'm sorry. He's karateing. I'm clever kaiing. <laughs> Kung fu fighting. Um. All right, I think that's going to do it uh, for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean. Well, we have news, but we'll come back later, just the two of us, after a short break. And then, uh, yeah, just for the second part of this story, it's not going to be on our podcast. You're going to have to go over to New York Mystery Machine. Yes. And um, to be very clear, make sure you subscribe, make sure you're all set up, and we'll finish the story there. Yes, to be very clear, we will still have a podcast next week. <laughs> New York New York Mystery Machine has a podcast this week. It's just that this series goes across. It's If you read comic books, you know what we're doing. But if you're not a comic book fan... <laughs> Part one on this cross, feed. It's just a crossover. It's just a crossover. Part guys. two on their feed. Um, yeah. Well, thanks for having us. Oh, yeah, thanks. thanks for having us on the show. Thank you for being on with us, guys. And um, uh, keep it scary. We don't really have a, a sign-off that way. <laughs> keep it scary. scary. It's fun. Keep it scary. <laughs> um, no, we'll we'll do so, do this again soon because this was uh, uh, awesome. This was this was fantastic. So our listeners should look forward to hearing you guys again, and yeah. on your and, own and, show. Yeah, and and for now, you guys are going to jump in the car and just drive down to New right. York, and we'll see you there. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Uh, we are. <laughs> <laughs> we'll avoid the taconic though. <laughs> <laughs> The, I haven't really woken up oh, until I've had my McDonald's breakfast deal. And I know this is true because before breakfast, I put my phone in the refrigerator and couldn't find the keys that were already in my hand. Nothing gets the morning going like the first sip of an iced coffee. Get any size and any flavor for 99 cents until 11 a.m. Price and participation may vary. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. McDonald's, I'm loving it. It's true crime time. Robert Durst, alleged serial killer and infamous star of the HBO true crime documentary series The Jinx, has died during imprisonment of cardiac arrest at the age of 78. For he's a jolly dead fellow. (laughs) I don't think he was jolly at all. (laughs) (laughs) I killed him. I killed them all. Per The Cut... Durst is believed to have murdered three people, his wife, Kathleen, who vanished under suspicious circumstances in 1982, his longtime friend and alibi for the night of Kathleen's vanishing, Susan Berman, in 2000, and his neighbor, Morris Black, in 2001. Durst received his life sentence for Berman's murder. Prosecutors argued that he confided in Berman after he killed Kathleen, then turned around and murdered her to keep her from talking. The one killing he did actually admit to was Black's, though he claimed it had been self-defense. He had been hiding out in Galveston, Texas at the time, dressing up daily as a woman. Okay. (laughs) But Black, described by the New York Times as a 71-year-old cantankerous former merchant seaman, somehow saw through that disguise and discovered Durst's real identity. Durst then shot him, dismembered his body, and dumped it in Galveston Bay. Durst was arrested after this murder at a Wegmans in Pennsylvania while attempting to shoplift a chicken salad sandwich. Can you imagine? They do have good chicken salad, though, so I get it. I love chicken salad, but I would pay for it. Well, not if you were on the run. (laughs) His trial in 2003 was a spectacle. Durst claimed that he did chop up his neighbor and dispose of the body, but the death itself was an accident. His story was that the gun went off in Black's face as the two men grappled. Oops! Somehow, Durst was acquitted. In early 2015, HBO released the six-part documentary The Jinx, The Life and Deaths of Robert Durst, (laughs) which outlined the circumstantial evidence tying Durst to the death of Susan Berman and the disappearance of his wife, Kathleen McCormick. The documentary series famously ended with Durst walking into a bathroom, where his hot mic seemingly catches him talking to himself and saying, quote, There it is. You're caught. You're right, of course, but you can't imagine. Arrest him. I don't know what's in the house. Oh, I want this. What a disaster. He was right. I was wrong. And the burping. I'm having difficulty with the question. What the hell did I do? 
killed them all, of course. He was newly arrested and charged for Berman's murder in 2015, and his 2021 trial found him sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for her killing. In 2021, he contracted COVID-19, which intensified the decrease in his health, culminating in his death on January 10th of this year of cardiac arrest. At this point, some things about his crimes are now bound to remain a mystery. That part is the only tragedy in this death. (laughs) Absolutely. That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary. And check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash ain't it scary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We'll be forever grateful. Don't forget to head over to our friends at the New York Mystery Machine podcast, subscribe, and listen to us on their Hudson Valley UFOs part two episode next week. Yep, that's next Monday. So if you're listening to this the day it comes out, it's in just four days. Um, We also have very soon something fun coming on Patreon. It's going to be me reading some um, rights-free, (laughs) royalty-free literary works to Caroline, uh, who will react appropriately. And I might be coming in with my own rights-free readings, because next week, um, well, we might be tackling some mysteries surrounding a certain author. Yes, check uh, check your celebrity birthdays for, for a, <laughs> if you want to take a guess. Uh, or check our dog's name. A special <laughs> thanks to our beloved top-tier patrons, Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, Maria Ferrante, Robin McCabe, Comfy Mike, Alex Nakutis, Ryan Regan, and Christy Atchison. Thank you very much, guys. We love you all. See you next Thursday. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe. Music by Kyle Ryan. You can find Kyle at his YouTube channel, Music is a Verb. This has been a production of Longboy Media. (laughs) 